Alan Johnson, I'm going to start with a quote from the veteran political journalist John Rental about you. If Alan Johnson had been a little more arrogant, a little madder, he could have been Prime Minister. <laughs> John was printing little badges with AJ for PM. Unfortunately, I didn't want to be PM and I certainly didn't want to be Labour leader, which was kind of a prerequisite to be Prime Minister. Uh, so, John, all nice stuff that people say, oh, you know, you should have been Prime Minister, but if you don't want to be Prime Minister and your heart's not in it, you know, it will show and it's best not to go anywhere near it. I mean, it has been said of American presidents that anyone who's daft enough to want to be an American president should disqualify themselves from, from the job. Um, I think there's some truth in that. Do you think you have to be, in, in John's word, a bit mad and arrogant? Do you have to be mad and arrogant to want that top job? There has to be something that I didn't have. I mean, thank God there are people with that. I think you have to be only arrogant in the sense that you really are convinced that you know what's best. I mean, my problem is that I could always see the other side of the argument. And, you know, I, I was never as emphatic uh, about that, let alone dogmatic. I mean, it's quite useful if you're not dogmatic. But, And I think if that's a, one definition of arrogance, that you know exactly what you want and you are absolutely remorseless and ruthless in pursuing it, then they are traits to be the leader. And I think, you know, it's wonderful there are, are people with those characteristics. Would you want to be locked in a lift with them? No, I don't think so. You know, would you be good mates with them? Probably not. Now, let's just look at your background. So you were orphaned. You didn't go to university. You left school without qualifications to become a postman. You led a trade union. But you've never been of the far left. What informed your politics? You're, you're pretty centrist in the Labour Party. Yeah, I had a while of a time, by the way. I mean, I left school to become a rock star. I'm still waiting for that. I mean, I joined the post office when I was 18. I left school when I was 15 and uh, stacked shelves at Tesco's. Was in a couple of bands. I had a while of a time. Why did I never f go to the far left? Uh, George Orwell. George Orwell. So when I was 14, I had a wonderful English teacher and I absorbed any book that came anywhere near me. But this lovely teacher, Peter Carlin, who I've dedicated my latest novel to. When's that? What's that about? The Late Train to Gypsy Hill. It's a thriller. The heroes are Ukrainians and the villains are Russians, by the way. And I wrote it three years ago. So there you are. Um, and I dedicate it to Peter, who's still alive, Peter Carlin, age 90. But he got all us boys reading, it was a boys' school, Animal Farm by George Orwell. And he explained the subtext of the Bolshevik Revolution. Of course, Orwell, a democratic socialist, was warning against totalitarianism, where it was on the right fascism or the left. It's the 1940s when he wrote it. And I just went out and bought everything I could and read everything I could by George Orwell. And it, so it wasn't, apart from Mr. Carlin, who explained that subtext, it wasn't a teacher that, it wasn't a university labor club or university tutors who molded my politics. It was a man who died before I was born, uh, Eric Blair otherwise known as George Orwell. So I was a Blairite in that sense, uh, even as a 14 year old. And I just would, n and none of my mates, I mean, my mates around West London, Shepherd's Bush and all that, you know, we got dressed up, we were mods. And we got dressed up because the great definition of a mod by Pete Whedon, who, uh, who was the manager of The Who, said clean living in difficult circumstances. You know, we didn't want to dress in denim with loads of badges on and walk around, you know, like we'd, uh, we'd just been rolled up in a carpet. And, uh, but all these people were coming to us when we were in disputes and on strikes with my union when I was postman, saying to us, you know, spread the strike. These were all kind of posh kids dressing down. We were poor kids dressing up. And they never meant anything to me at all. We used to laugh at them. I mean, thank God the swappies are around still, the SWP, because, you know, I miss them. Uh, where would you be without them with this kind of idea that all you have to do is come out on strike and stay out on strike forever and the whole world will be yours? I mean, syndicalism, uh, just one of their crude beliefs. So, no, I never fell 
for the far left, but I certainly was on the left. I saw a rant, uh, you ranting at the head of the left wing faction, Momentum. Uh, it was during or just following Jeremy Corbyn's tenure as Labour leader. Because you're not a finger wagger, but I think you might have finger wagged during this when you said Jeremy Corbyn couldn't lead the working classes out of a paper bag. Yeah, it, it was a rant, you're right, and I apologise for it, but it was midnight on election night. We'd just heard about 2019. the seats. 2019. I mean, we lost Bishop Auckland. We lost, lost Sedgefield. We lost your seat. We lost seats we had been uh, in for ever since, you know, the dawn of history. In comes Landsman, I've known for a long time, and he was, with, he was a Benite and all that, boasting that we were going to win Putney. Oh, brilliant. We're going to win Putney. I mean, we lost all these other seats. We lost Gunthorpe, we lost Grimsby, we lost all the seats around me in East Yorkshire, but we're going to win Putney. And, uh, you know, you could see then what the outcome of this adventurism was going to be. Uh, the worst election defeat we've experienced in our history, virtually. Should Jeremy Corbyn be allowed back in the Labour Party? No way. No, no, no. Leave him where he is. And he'll be happy and sanctimonious and pious where he is. Leave him there. He never followed the Labour whip. I mean, this idea that we were allowing this group, the campaign group, to form their own opinions and their own rules and their own whip, and they would follow their own whip. I mean, it was madness. And it led to Momentum, which was a Jeremy Corbyn fan club. I mean, these people are out there and they're entitled to their beliefs, but they've got to stand on their beliefs, not try and infiltrate the Labour Party. The Labour Party has never been to the far left. The trade unionists who formed the Labour Party did, as was famously said, owe more for, to Methodism than Marxism. And throughout our history, they've been the far left have tried to steal our clothes because they know that we have purchase in communities. We are part of working class communities. And for these middle class revolutionaries, they've just been trying to wear our cloak. Um, and this was the most successful attempt at it. And it ended in the disaster that we saw. Now, so you are Blair, right? You're, you're New Labour. Those posh New Labour types, you know, the PPE Oxford Brigade. Did you, did you ever feel intimidated when you got into Parliament in 1997? There were a fair, there were mm. a fair number of those. Even, even more came in mm. slightly later, actually, in 2001 and 2005. Mm -hmm. What did you think of that? I wasn't, no, because part of the previous issue that you were saying about, um, about Corbyn and these people, I don't look at people with those kind of labels. I mean, I always said about Cameron and Osborne, they were as responsible for their childhoods as I was responsible for mine. They had no choice about whether they were, you know, sent off to Eton or whatever. If I was against old Etonians, I'd be against George Orwell. You know, he was an old Etonian. Clem Attlee, you know, etc. So I don't look at, I look at people in terms of humanity and on the far left, there was a real lack of humanity because they did castigate people because of whatever some, they, it wasn't about the personality at all. It was about something that they believed in that uh, transgressed their beliefs. So I didn't look at it like that. And when I got into politics, it wasn't so much in parliament because you had all kinds of people there. As you know, we had an ex-taxi driver Clive Efford. For those who think it's a shame the people who really know how to run the country are too busy driving cabs. Hmm? <laughs> we had one in there uh, and he's still there. Clive, brilliant. Uh, you know, we had a couple of bricklayers. We had a gas worker. We had miners. Uh, in the civil service, once I became a minister and I was 11 years as a minister, I met a lot of those and I never, I never came across a, an ounce of snobbery. It, I never experienced it. At all. Um, you know, maybe I was fortunate in that respect, but I didn't have the, anybody looking down at me. Ernie Bevin had the same experience. With, it was the great Ernie Bevin, who left school at 13, uh, was orphaned at nine, and uh, had no education whatsoever, taught himself to write, but was one of the greatest foreign secretaries we ever had. And he said that he had none of that experience either. So you were higher education minister. That Labour government, and I remember your speech, Mm -hmm. You put push through tuition fees. Yeah. Um, in fact, you personally, because of your upbringing and um, 
your the nature of your speech you were it was it was said that you you contributed a, a large part to introducing the tuition fees yeah was that the right thing to do yeah absolutely god almighty i mean this argument about higher education you know when i was born uh two percent went to university two percent and that wasn't because the others didn't qualify it was because it kept as a you know, for a tiny elite, for a small elite. And there was a great debate about that. Less means more. Kingsley Amos used to argue this. The more you allow into higher education, the more sort of discredited it will become. This was crazy. And we wanted to expand higher education. There was a huge funding gap in higher education. Um, they, le- they needed about 11 billion quid to put our universities on a kind of proper scale and to expand university places. So, you know, I was very uh, keen. I mean, it, it, the free university education uh, post the Robbins report hadn't uh, changed things whatsoever. The social class gap in higher education had not narrowed. It had widened. So, yeah, kids making a contribution, not when they're kids, by the way, but when they've graduated, when they're earning more than 21000 when the money is taken out of their pay by the chancellor... And when they've got years and yonks to pay it, and if their wage ever drops, then they stop paying the fees. The people who were opposed to it, of course, were the Daily Mail, the Daily Express, middle class people who saw free higher education. They were probably prepared to pay a lot of money for private schools, but they didn't think they should pay in higher education. They were the people that were most vehemently against it. The kids understood, working class kid, bright working class kid understood, hold on, I don't have to ask mum and dad for anything. We reintroduced grants as part of that. I don't have to ask my mum and dad for anything. For for, 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 As part of the same deal. It's it's down to me. It's gone now, I think. Uh, Well, I was born messed up with that. I've got the, you know, I've got, uh, I pay this uh, uh, tuition fee, but I don't see it. It's a million miles away from credit card debt. They understood it very quickly, which is why, you know, as I went round to different campuses, at the time, it, it wasn't the students that were the problem. It was people who had been students and felt this was uh, some kind of crime against humanity. No, no one's going to do away with tuition fees. Graduates making a contribution towards their very expensive higher education will be there forevermore. Um, so the, the backdrop to, to that last Labour government, the longest Labour government ever... But this war between number 10 and number 11, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, it was always rumbling. It was always constantly written about. It flared up. It calmed. It fla- but none of us know, actually, you had a ringside seat. You were a minister during that. How, how bad was it? Oh, it was awful. I, I didn't understand it fully. I mean, that was tuition fees. Was Gordon was against tuition fees until Tony had gone, and then he was very much in favour of tuition fees. And I admire both of them. I worked for both of them, and I really, really admire Gordon. God, if you had a man with his, you know, ethics back in power, we'd be in a we'd be a different country. Um, but why didn't the two get on? They'd been such close friends. I know as much as you know, Gloria. It was all about Gordon thinking he was due to get the succession after however many years. And claims that Tony reneged on a on a deal, although he's never told me that. I've never heard that from the horse's mouth. But what did it mean? It meant you went to cabinet meetings where Gordon would just sit and like a naughty kid in a class, and you know, with his head down, wouldn't even make eye contact with Tony. And to me, they were the Lennon McCartney, uh, as was famously said, of, of Labour politics. And if they'd have worked together more closely at that crucial period of the handover from one to the other, it could have been a very different... We could have still been in power. Of course, what happened is that Gordon couldn't wait, even though he knew Tony had said he's not going to stand in another uh, election. Um, And that really soured the party and I think was detrimental to us in government. Another thing that was detrimental to your time in government, the Iraq war. Yeah, there's been a lot of revisionism on on that. You know, people who were there. This was the only time, first time this country has ever been to war by a parliamentary decision. It's always been raw proclamation. And the people who made that decision in parliament had to take some ownership for it. Now, you get all this stuff about we were misled, weapons of mass destruction. Most Here's the thing about weapons of mass destruction. We know Saddam and his 
psychotic sons had weapons of mass destruction. He used them twice against his own people, the Iraqi Kurds and the, uh, and the Marsh Arabs. We know he had them. That's why the weapons inspectors were called in by the UN as part of a 12 years of UN resolutions to say you ought to get rid of them. You can read, go back, I know you weren't there at the time, go back and read the Hansard debate when Parliament decided to go to war. It had Hans Blix, who was the weapons examiner, inspector, laying out the weapons of mass destruction, which we know Saddam had and was unaccounted for. Poison gas, sarin, the, all the dreadful... We know he had them. What well, people didn't realise that somehow he'd got rid of them. I mean, remember, we went to war because the UN set, set a, yet another deadline. If he doesn't let the weapons inspectors come in and have open access, uh, you know, serious consequences will follow. That's the exact words of Resolution 1441. And to back off once again, after 12 years of him running rings around the United Nations, would have been, would have been disastrous. We'll never know what would have happened if Saddam and his psychotic sons had stayed there. But I know one thing, if I was in that same situation, listening to all of that evidence over again, I would have voted the same way. We're coming towards the end now. I want you to imagine having the job that you said that you'd had absolutely no desire to do. Your Labour Prime Minister. <laughs> What's the first thing you're going to do? It's your number one thing. I, I much more enjoyed writing books, Gloria, but if you put me, if you pin me down for that, it's, it's early years. It's, it's going back to those early years. You know, the kind of society we want, uh, we'll call it what you want. I see it's called levelling up now, but the kind of fair society we want. These inequalities in our society don't start when a kid gets to 10 or 12 or 18. They start to talk to, talk to anyone who's involved in this at a year, 18 months, i.e. bright kid, working class background, starts to decline, against perhaps a less bright kid from a middle-class background. Happens in the very early years. That's why Sure Start was so important. That's why investment in those early years was so important. That's why, um, you know, the social aspects of learning. We had a scheme on this, on the early years of teaching kids how to resolve disputes between them without battling and fighting and shouting at each other. It's a very important aspect of the education system and it's practically non-existent now. Sure Start's gone. You know, it's a shell compared to what it once was. And I would put money, effort and time into that. And incidentally, it's not higher education that was uh, lacking the kind of funds. It, 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 was that, it was those very early years. So people talking about, oh, they ought to have free higher education would need to take that money, 11, 12 billion, from the places where it's most needed and where it's most important. So I'd, I'd focus on that and I'd carry a law that said Queen's Park Rangers had to win the premiership every, every season. They're the two things I would really concentrate on. Right. Very finally, very finally. <laughs> and I, like, let's take it as a given that when I say who's the one to watch or who could you see being the next Labour Prime Minister, let's just take it as a given that you're going to say, well, of course, Keir Starmer will be the next Labour Prime Minister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, OK. Lisa Nandy. OK. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Johnson. If I can't have you, because you're out now, <laughs> I'll have Lisa Nandy. She's welcome to it. <laughs> but we would rather, we want the, lots of the nation think it should have been you, including oh, that's, me. That's nice of them. That's nice of them. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. Gloria. Thank you.